Welcome back to Church and State with Dave Pello. This morning we're sitting down with Stuart Ballantyne, owner of Sea Transport. Stuart, you've got some really, really interesting ideas about sea transport, not your company, but the, the concept for Australia. We're currently talking about huge investment in rail and road in Australia, but you're saying we're overlooking the obvious in the water. Tell me more about that. Absolutely. Um, I've been campaigning like John the Baptist out in the wilderness for the last 25 years uh, about coastal shipping and the advantages it has technically, commercially and environmentally. And just recently I've started doing a series of Australia's maritime transport policy, excellence and stupidity. Okay. Now, the reason why I changed it to a sort of slightly con confrontational uh, title is that they then make me the last speaker. <laughs> and, I said, and I said to them the first time, I said, why are you making me the last speaker? They said, no one's going to leave with a title like this. <laughs> uh, and uh, Maybe we should make it the title of the uh, interview today, well, the, the episode. <laughs> well, and I can tell you what I've done in the last few ep episodes that I've done of this in, in different places, in public forums. I always get to the lectern and I said, ladies and gentlemen, if you're offended easily, uh, or uh, have thin skins, now is probably a good time to leave the room. Uh, I said, but before I start, I'd like to paraphrase a section out of the Old Testament of the Bible. And the, la the land was overrun with hosts of Philistines. And I said, and you're probably all wondering what a Philistine is these days. It's the green, boating, tree-hugging, ABC-watching, same-sex marriage zealots and other troglodytes that are bringing our great nation down. <laughs> and I sincerely believe that. <laughs> and I said, now, uh, now that I've got your attention and we've established the political correctness... And how much cheer do you get from that? <laughs> no, I, I see everyone sitting there with a jaw and going, I can't believe they said this in this political correctness, uh, the stupidity <laughs> state that we've gone to in Australia. Yeah. Uh, and I said, now, to prove that uh, we're so stupid in this country, I'm going to show you some, some slides that uh, is going to knock your socks off. The first slide is a paddle steamer on the Murray River 160 years ago, powered by a 20 horsepower steam engine, log fired, okay, 160 years ago. Now this paddle steamer can tra could at the time transport 2,000 bales of wool. And you think, gee, that's pretty impressive. 160 years later, to come to today, to transport 2,000 bales of wool needs 20 semi-trailers, Mm -hmm. each with a 400 horsepower turbocharged diesel. So in 160 years, we've moved from 20 horsepower for one task. For the same task, we've gone to 8,000 horsepower. Now, I'm just a dumb Scottish migrant, but that to me doesn't seem progress technically, commercially, or environmentally. And what most people don't know about the uh, Murray River, it's actually navigable 970 kilometers from the barrage, but it's also navigable uh, 36 meters above sea level. And remember those numbers, they're really very important numbers. Uh, because our forefathers had lots of vision. They didn't have heavy earth moving equipment. They didn't have this and that and the other. But they also didn't have regulations, rules, <laughs> green rules, green tape. Mm -hmm. But if you actually went to the other side of the country and came in at the Gulf of Carpentaria, I said, okay, well, we'll take one of those rivers and do what they did in the Murray. Uh, we'll dredge it and we'll put some locks in there and we'll go to 36 meters above the sea level. We will arrive in a place called Gregory Downs. And you think, well, where's Gregory Downs? Well, Gregory Downs is, if you go to the Gulf of Carpentaria, you'll see it down there about probably 150 kilometers in from the coast. That is in the center of one billion tons of phosphate, hmm. which is a locked resource. You say, well, what's a locked resource? A locked resource is stuff that you can't dig out of the ground, stick on a truck, take the truck to Mount Isa, take it on the rail then to Townsville, then stick it on a ship, or go the other way to Darwin at a price cheaper than what you can sell it for, right? So in other words, it's, uh, it's a locked resource. Economically, it's not even worth doing. Okay. So you have to change your transport thinking. So if we, so because of the transport costs, yeah. it's not economically viable to bother with. That's right. There is no port that's anywhere near these resources. You know. So uh, 
And you think, well, why haven't we done that? Now, at the moment, we're, uh, we're messing around with our focus on road and rail. Mm -hmm. uh, I can show you the graph of where rail in Europe has flatlined since 1970. You say, well, how does it flatline? It's like if you and I, Dave, have a, a model railway set, mm. we can only get so many trains around the track. It's the same with pipelines. You can only get so many things through the pipeline or through the railway track, you know? So, uh, but we have myopically focused on road and rail. And now we've got this massive billion dollars we're spending on uh, rail uh, we, we're gonna, with this Brisbane to Darwin and rail link and all that sort of stuff, or Brisbane to Melbourne to Brisbane, and everyone's saying rail, rail, rail. It is actually totally the wrong way to go. If I have to build a railway uh, uh, from scratch anywhere in this country, it's going to cost me roughly about $14 on capex per million tons uh, per kilometer. What's on capex? On the capital expenditure. Mm -hmm. If I do a canal, it's $2. Uh, if I do a 14 or 2 uh, Yeah, you say, well, it's 14 for the railway. If I do a whole road, it's 10 mm -hmm. But most whole roads at the moment uh, are... Uh, uh, costing around about $13,000 per kilometer per annum maintenance. Why would we do that? Yeah. You know, and if we go back to the the 8,000 horsepower on the trucks, they're also paying this enormous, uh, fuel the, the fuel cost, but they're also paying the enormous road maintenance cost. Yeah. So if I'm taking it over 100 kilometers, I can reduce on river tra travel, I can reduce the cost by 92%. Wow. And then when you say, well, let's come to the emissions. The emissions, I can save the emissions 96%. Gee. Which is really quite astounding. Yeah. And uh, to say, well, this is actually quite impressive. Yeah. Say next door to my neighbor. <laughs> uh, now people say, well, we, why can't we do that? The fact is that we've tied ourselves up with rules and regulations, mainly green rules and regulations, that we actually can't get in, we can't dredge, we can't do this, we can't do that, we can't touch these mangroves, we can't do that. For what reason? Yep. And it is just absurd that if there was a competition, uh, uh, an Olympics competition on shooting yourself in the foot, at the moment Australia would win gold, silver and bronze, yep. because we've tied ourselves up and the future of our kids and our grandkids with idiotic rules that are over the top, you know, with these green warming, uh, you know, the planet warming cultists. Yeah. It's just madness, yeah. total madness. And, and unfortunately, we don't have leadership that's got enough spine to stand up to them. Mm -hmm. It's a real shame. But in, in terms of using our waterways, we should be focusing on that as a transport policy. If you speak to any other transport policy around the country, people, uh, uh, whether federal, state, or local, they would have no idea what you're talking about. Well, I, I know because I've addressed most of them over the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, terrible. So what kind of reasons do they come up with for, for saying, no, we're not gonna do, that? that's t too big, too hard? Uh, yeah. We're worried about mangroves and dredging? Right. The, the green rules around our coast are really, uh, now they have managed to lock it down. It's okay. a real shame, yeah. they've managed to lock it down. So, and it is too hard. They can understand road and rail because, yeah, there's roads up across here and there's railways up there. They can actually get their heads around it. What are other parts of the world doing with this? Do, have the Enviro Nazis got roads and rail dominant thinking in Europe and no, America? No, in fact, well, they've actually realized if you're serious about the environmental uh, aspects, which they should be, this is what you should be doing. If you go to St. Petersburg, for instance, at nighttime at St. Petersburg, when all the tourists go to bed about eight or nine o'clock, they open up all the bridges in the city and all these barges, can, they move during the night. If you go to Amsterdam, mm. all these barges are moving forward, backwards and forwards in the middle of the tourist okay. areas and they're brightly colored and painted. And, here, if you mentioned, oh, we're going to move barges. Oh, no, we can't do that. That's, you know. That's okay, so nonsense. let's talk, uh, you tell me what time frame, 10, 20, 50 years, and tell me over that time frame, what would the benefits be? What could we move? How much people, how much cargo? We could unlock 
almost every locked resource in this country. If we actually had a... Okay, so we can access a lot of our natural resources. Absolutely. What about existing transport? How many, how many road movements could we reduce? Let's uh, say if we follow all your, like, totally go the whole hog, dredging, port development, all the things that we need to do, how long would that take? 10, uh, 20, 50 years? Well, no, the, the second part of the presentation, which was, uh, I was referring to inland waterways before, but on coastal waterways, for instance, um, we kill, so looking at the cost, the road cost issue, we kill 1,300 people a year mm -hmm. uh, around, mainly around the coastal roads in this country. Mm -hmm. At a much bigger cost and much bigger impact, social impact, is that we seriously injure 18,000 people a year around oh. 18,000 because, and the reason I say that's a more serious impact is that families then have to look after you know, with the wheelchairs yeah. and et cetera, et cetera. And we know because, you know, uh, my father-in-law was a, a victim of a hit and run mm -hmm. truck accident. So for 13 years, we were pushing the wheelchair and it changes the whole family. Yeah, it's kind of like in battle, if you want to really impact the enemy, you wound a soldier yes. instead of killing them. That's right. Because it takes out everybody around him to support him and That's look after correct. him. That's correct. So it's, it's exactly that. So, uh, but if you then say, well, let's look at abstats and road accidents, road deaths and road accidents, there's about 27 billion a year. And then you add road congestion, road maintenance, it comes to a total of 50 billion a year. Now, Europe, very cleverly, they said, well, let's do motorways of the sea. So about 20 odd years ago, they funded a subsidy to take the trucks off the road. And this is right through the Mediterranean, up around the Baltic and all the coastal roads. Now, we really in this country, we only have coastal roads because most people live around the coast. Mm -hmm. And we've been saying, listen, guys, we've got to emulate success. Yeah. They did in Europe, they only had to subsidize the motorways of the sea year one. Now, wow. in, the, in the first two years, they took 60% of the truck movements off, off the highway. Wow. Now, if we could, that's a huge number, but it's a huge saving because if you actually look at the, the source of the road accidents, road maintenance, road pollution, it's actually trucks. It's not cars, mm. uh, and you're eight times likely to have a truck involved in a fatality and an accident than a car. Wow. It's really quite interesting. Uh, you say, well, let's focus on getting the trucks off the road. I've stood in front of so many politicians, federal and state, and I've spoken to uh, marine industry groups and community groups, and they go, yeah, that's a great idea. No one's got it. No one's got the... Uh, I, I, and you're saying it's basically the Enviro Nazis that are holding the yes, nation to ransom? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, people are also a bit uh, terrified about the Maritime Union. And uh, last month I actually met with uh, Paddy Crumlin, who's the secretary of the MUA. I did this whole presentation again on why we should be using our waterways. But I went a little bit further with him. Surely they'd be a supporter thinking there'd be more jobs. Uh, well, yes, they agree that there should be more jobs, but because they've got such a colorful history <laughs> of messing people around on the waterfront and in ships that no one trusts them anymore. So the only way they'll trust them is actually if they put skin in the game. And I've challenged uh, Paddy Crumlin over the last three years, put some money on the table of your union money into the, any venture, the industry will follow you. At the moment, that nobody's putting money on the table because they don't trust you. It's a real shame. So between, I'd say 80% is the Enviro Nazis have uh, stuffed it up. And with the compliance, I tell you, uh, of the federal, state, and local governments, because they've all got regulators everywhere, mm. you know, that you can't sneeze without someone reporting you. Mm. Uh, so we have a, a situation that we have to sort of control. Well, in uh, the previous segment, Stuart, uh told us how he answered census question on census night, where does he live? It's at Qantas. But recently he's written a letter to Qantas and to various newspaper editors 
um, explaining that he's no longer going to keep his business with Qantas because of the political interference they've decided to take upon themselves in Australian politics. So in our next segment, watch that and we'll have a chat with Stuart about Qantas and them staying out of politics and sticking to planes.